Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, we have today uh, Professor Robert F. Chris, who is a biomedical engineer, and he is the Executive Director, Cleveland Functional Electric Stimulation Center Research Career Scientific Louis Stoke Cleveland. He is also uh, uh, is a Professor and Chair, Department of Biomedical Engineering, Case Western Reserve University. And he's going to talk on a very, very interesting and upcoming uh, topic, rehab, that is uh, reconnecting the hand and arm to the brain. There's a BCI, that is a brain con computer interface control of upper limb uh, function or FES through the FES. So Professor Robert, uh, kindly take the seat and start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real honor to be able to speak to you uh, this evening. Uh, I have nothing but the best wishes for all of you in this uh, unusual time. Um, maybe someday I'll be able to meet some of you uh, in person, but it, it's uh, it's great that we can do this virtually uh, during during our current situations. Okay, as, as was said, I'm the, the Professor and Chair in Biomedical Engineering at Case Western Reserve University and the Executive Director of the Cleveland Functional Electrical Stimulation System, or uh, Center, sorry. And I'll just say a few words about my two institutions to give you some context. Our, our Biomedical Engineering Department at, at uh, Case Western Reserve is, is more than 50 years old. It's one of the oldest uh, biomedical engineering departments in the, in the U United States. Um, about two years ago, we entered into an alliance with the Biomedical Engineering Department at the Cleveland Clinic to, to form the, Bi the Biomedical Engineering Alliance. Um, this is a major uh, alliance now. We have 56 uh, primary faculty members that are, that are very esteemed and, and, uh, and prominent. Um, we have more than $40 million in research funding. We have about 450 undergraduate students about uh, 180 uh, graduate or PhD students and about 80 um, uh, master's students. And we have a very strong uh, commercialization and translational research uh, activity that has generated uh, more than 700 patents over the last uh, 10 years and has moved a number of our laboratory discoveries into products that are used on the market. Um, we have a very broad range of of research topics that are pursued by our faculty. There's the, that we have a, a, it's called the Walter H. Coulter, Wallace H. Coulter um, Foundation program that helps do this translational research. And just to give you an idea, our campus, our, uh, where, where we're located for biomedical engineering is surrounded by major medical centers. So this is Case Western Reserve now in, in the yellow shading. The Cleveland Clinic is just down the street. University Hospitals is right next door. And the, the first or second uh, busiest uh, Veterans Affairs Medical Center in the United States is just down the street as well. So we really have a, a, a great uh, geographical situation for pursuing uh, clinical problems in, from our biomedical engineering department. The, the, the FES Center has been around for about 27 years as well. It's, it's very well established. It's funded by the Department of Veterans Affairs. But we're really a center um, for functional electrical stimulation that includes partners. So we have Case Western Reserve University as a partner. Metro Health Medical Center is a, is a major uh, public hospital in Cleveland. University Hospitals is our next door neighbor um, to Case Western Reserve. And the Cleveland Clinic, as I said, is just down the street. So we have we have a really a consortium, an umbrella group that um, brings people together that do a variety of different kinds of neurological research and clinical practice. Um, we do research in a number of areas related to the neurological um, area. I'll talk today about restoring movement, and that has been a a major um, focus of the of the FES Center for uh, many years. Uh, we also do a lot of what's called brain health. That includes stroke rehabilitation, uh, um, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, um, traumatic brain injury, and many other um, uh, applications, and, and, and including a beginning of for, for psychiatric disorders. 
We have a, a large pain mitigation group that, that, that studies new ways of, of relieving pain without the use of medications through electrical stimulation. And an increasingly um, uh, important area is an autonomic nervous system uh, electrical stimulation to do targeted uh, control of autonomic functions like blood pressure and heart rate and inflammation and digestion and many other uh, autonomic functions. And in the middle, we have a technology core that develops devices, develops uh, interface, neural interfacing, um, computer simulations, many other uh, technical um, developments that sort of provide the glue that holds all these disparate uh, clinical applications together. Um, we have applications all around the body. Um, I'm not going to go through these in a lot of detail, but it's, you know, some of the things I talked about for the brain interfacing, for movement, for bladder function, for respiration, um, many other things. Um, the other thing that we're very well known for is doing the translation from discovery into applications in people. So we call this uh, first in man. We do a lot of first in man uh, applications of various kinds of technologies. And I'll talk a little bit about that in my own uh, work in, in a few minutes. And finally, um, the people that are in the FBS Center. We have 85 um, research investigators and 52 of these 85 are clinicians. They're neurologists like yourselves, they're neurosurgeons, they're urologists, they're orthopedic surgeons, they're psychiatrists. There's a, a, a wide range of, of clinicians and then 33 PhD scientists that are um, biomedical engineers like myself, but neuroscientists and, and, and a number of other groups. Um, we have a, a big staff and um, that, that help us uh, perform this work and maintain our clinical or our administrative operations. And you'll notice we have 60 trainees. We do a lot of training of PhD students, of master's students and postdoctoral, and the postdoctoral include the medical fellows. Okay, so that's uh, a little bit about, um, you know, the environment that I work in. Uh, my topic today is, is basically how do we restore arm and hand function to people that have high cervical spinal cord injuries and, and give them intuitive control over this? So what's shown on this slide is our, is our concept. This is where we would like to go with our, with our research eventually. We would like a, a, an FES system as functional electrical stimulation. So we would like to implant a functional electrical stimulation system that electrically stimulates uh, paralyzed muscles in the arm and hand to actually power uh, movements, to restore the, the physical movements and obtain signals from the brain that tell the, the FES system what the person is intending to do with their arm and hand. So in a nutshell, that is, that is what we're trying to do and what I'll talk about today is some of the FES work and some of the brain computer interface work. It's going to be a summary. So if you have specific questions, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer the, uh, about some of the details, but I'm going to focus on the, on, the, on the high level aspects of this today. So as it says, they were focused on people with high level complete uh, uh, tetraplegia at C1 to C4, typically Asia A, sometimes Asia B. And what this means is that they have paralysis of all their muscles below their neck and highly impaired sensation, obviously. Um, and they have relatively limited uh, rehabilitation options at, at the present. Um, things are better than they were when I started in this field in terms of options. You know, there, there's technologies that allow people to control their lights and their television and telephones and, and similar things. But in terms of restoring their movements, there's very, still very few um, options in the rehabilitation world. So I've spent most of my career uh, up until about 10 or 15 years ago, putting together a functional electrical stimulation system that would allow us to restore movement to these individuals. And the, red, the big red star down in the right-hand corner at the bottom 
that, that's our goal. We want to restore movement to people that have um, these kinds of spinal cord injuries. So that's the goal. And if you back up in the middle, it says integrated. Can you see my, my pointer? I hope so. Um, it says integrated FES system. This is a, uh, a diagram of the functional electrical stimulation system that we implanted. And I'll talk about that in, in a second, but it's basically two pacemaker-like devices, one implanted up in the shoulder region, one down on the lateral uh, abdomen region. And each one of them has 12 uh, channels of electrical stimulation that go to different muscles. So we have 24 total and they go to muscles from the shoulder down in, all the way down the arm into the hand. The, uh, so that's, that's like to generate the power for the movement, like I said before, but there's other things. Um, there's more than 24 muscles in the arm and the hand. So which one do we stimulate to provide the most function with our limited number of stimulation channels? That's on the left. Um, what kind of technology do we use? That's up, to, up at, the, at the top, and, and I'll go into these in a little more detail. These were mostly borrowed from my colleagues um, that had developed implanted stimulators and, and some of the cuff electrodes. But we added some, some uh, specific things for this population as well. And finally, we need to give a, a effective technique for the person to tell their arm and hand what to do in, in a pretty... Um, uh, intuitive way, as intuitive as possible. Um, it's very limited because they can on, they only have voluntary control over things up in their neck and, and head and face area. So I list some possibilities there and, and I'll come back and talk about those in a minute. But the, the, again, the basic idea is we want to restore function. We're going to do that by electrically stimulating muscles and we have to figure out which muscles to stimulate, how we're going to stimulate them, and how we're going to give the person control over those, um, those mov movements. So one of the things we did long ago, um, this is not a experiment, it is not, it's not viable to do experimentation to figure out which muscles to stimulate. There's too many muscles. The, the approach that we use is invasive and it's just not possible to try out all the possibilities. So we developed a computer-based uh, biomechanical model of the shoulder and arm. And it, it's, it's quite sophisticated. It took a number of years to do this. We adjusted it for spinal cord injury. And then we adjusted it for um, a person with spinal cord injury whose muscles are being stimulated. So we basically went through and ran millions and millions of, of computer simulations to figure out which set of muscles would give us the most uh, functionality. And that was very, very effective. You know, it took some time, but it was the only option. Um, we had decided upon a set of movements that we wanted to restore. Um, these were based on um, clinical evaluations that many of you probably do about, uh, you know, how, how, what functions people have remaining. It's based on uh, user preferences that are published so we, we had about 30 different movements, um, mostly related to moving the hand and arm around in a workspace in front of the uh, person to do things like eating and drinking and things along those lines. So um, on the right, on the right side, it lists the muscles that we found were absolutely essential. Um, so we know we know which was which were we absolutely had to we have we that's not 24 so we had some optional things and we chose some additional muscles based on optional movements um, it gave us some insight into where to place nerve cuff electrodes because the the branches to the different muscles come off in different places and in a few cases um, there were, there were nerve branches that we did not want to stimulate because they, they, they caused us problems. Um, otherwise, they had, off, they had other actions that we didn't like. For example, the triceps long head extends the elbow, but it also um, adducts the shoulder. And one of our biggest challenges was abducting the shoulder because of the deltoid being weak in these individuals. So we avoided that. 
we avoided a, a few other play, uh, uh, muscles. We made sure that we could stimulate different muscles uh, separately, et cetera. So we went to our surgeons and said, here's, here's the muscles we'd like to do and the nerves that we'd like to stimulate. In a few cases, they said, no, I'm not going to do that. It's, it's, it's too risky. So we went back in an iterative uh, procedure and, and came up with a, a number of electrodes to, to implant. Okay, so I'll move forward. So this, this did, uh, before I go forward, this, this allowed us to determine which muscles to stimulate. Um, a number of these are, were going to be stimulated through nerve cuff electrodes, which I'll come back to. Um, it allowed us to figure out where to place those electrodes. And it also, one of the side uh, benefits of doing the muscle, the, the muscle uh, model, the musculocutaneous nerve planner, the, the biomechanical model, was that it also told us the activation pattern, the time, the temporal pattern of activations across these muscles that would give us the movements that we wanted. And that's not stated here, but that was a, a, big, uh, a big benefit. Okay, so let's go to how does a person that has a high cervical spinal cord injury, how do they command, how, what, what, kind, what, what are their options? So you've probably seen people drive wheelchairs with a chin joystick. Um, their sip and puff is another popular uh, interface for, for individuals with, high, with, high, with severe paralysis like this. Um, we looked at eye movements. Um, they're very precise and, and very uh, fast and um, not too difficult to obtain. We looked at head orientation, using your head as a joystick, basically. We looked at EMG signals from the face and the neck and the and other parts of the head. Um, we looked at voice recognition. Uh, the tongue is also a very dexterous way to um, to, to uh, pr potentially provide command information. Um, you could have this, this was a, an older technology that basically put a touch pad in the, in the roof of the mouth that you moved your tongue across. Um, later on, they put a, a piercing through the tongue and had magnetic sensors on the outside of the teeth to measure the magnetic field generated when it moved around. So in the end, um, most of these we did not go with. And there's, there's a variety of reasons for that. Some of them simply don't provide enough information. The chin joystick and the sip and puff um, provide you know, very limited uh, amount of information and slow. It wasn't well tolerated by our, the people that we tested this on. The uh, EOG is our eye movements. And again, those, th those work well, but the, you have to remember that these individuals have very limited voluntary function left and eye movements are one of them. And it just was not a good trade-off. They needed to have their eye movements free and not use it to control um, hand and arm movements. It's artificial. The same, the same way with head orientation. Um, the tongue touch keypad and the tongue drive system um, can't be used when you're speaking or eating or doing other important uh, activities of daily living. Voice recognition also worked pretty well. Um, people really that use this did not like it. Um, it. It drew attention to them and they already have, um, you know, electric wheelchairs or they're in a wheelchair and they draw attention to themselves anyway and they really didn't like that because they have to speak. You know, they, they, one, of the, one of the people said, I don't want to have to talk to my own arm to make it move. So we didn't do that. For our first round of of systems, we did we we did go with the head and neck uh, EMG. Okay, so like I said, we evaluated many of these. Um, we ended up with uh, head and neck EMGs um, for, for for a variety of reasons. Um, our stimulation system came with four channels of recording for EMG, which we could use. It was for free, basically. Um, they don't. It was implanted, so they didn't have to put anything on or take it off completely inconspicuous because it was implanted. Um, so it, it hit a lot of the, the right uh, requirements. The one thing that it wasn't great for, which I'll come back to, 
is that um, the, the, the surgeons and the people, our participants, did not want to have um, electrodes implanted around their face for good reasons. It, 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 it uh, could be scarring, et cetera. And they didn't want to use their face muscles to, uh, again, to control arm and hand movements. So these were placed on, on a kind of a, a mixture of different muscles. And it depended upon the person what the, the details of their spinal cord injury were. But in the end, we ended up putting one on the left platysma and one on the right platysma. This is a muscle, a, a facial expression muscle on the neck. Um, but it can give left and right uh, commands. Um, this particular individual that I'm showing here could, could control her left uh, trapezius, but not the right one. So we put one on the left trapezius, a shoulder shrugging muscle. And for the fourth one, we put the electrode behind her ear on the, um, in, on the right auricularis. It's a ear, ear wiggling uh, muscle and she could wiggle her ears. So um, th these were kind of again, a, a mixture of muscles, but this was all because of practical considerations. Okay, so I've talked about this. Um, you know, none of these are great. None, none of these uh, interfaces are, are good. They, they aren't naturally related to arm movements and that, that makes it artificial. They interfere with the few remaining functions that the people have in most cases and most require putting things on and taking them off and drawing attention to themselves. Okay, so this is the, the putting it all together slide. And on, on the left is a diagram of the functional electrical stimulation system. Uh, the various uh, um, lead wires are shown in different colors depending upon the, uh, the, which uh, stimulator that they use and what the nature of the signals are. So the important things to note are, you can see it right in the middle at the top is our, is our implanted stimulator. It looks like a, a, a pacemaker to some extent. There's electronics in, in a metal can, and then there's a, a, an antenna that, that is used to, uh, for inductive power to power the device. They wear a coil on the outside of their, of their body that powers through that, that coil. There are 12 channels of stimulation and two bipolar EMG recording signals uh, in each one of these, and there's two of them. So there's one that's planted up near where a pacemaker would be planted uh, in the upper chest. And then there's one implanted down in the lateral uh, abdomen area here. The, the, elect the EMG recordings are shown in blue and you can see the trapezius, the platysmas and the auricularis. The abdomen uh, stimulator has green leads and it was used to stimulate muscles in the shoulder and elbow area using nerve cuff electrodes. So you can see the nerve cuff electrodes are shown in the small uh, green uh, boxes that are uh, placed on different nerves. The stimulator that's in the upper uh, chest is primarily going down the arm to activate muscles that, that are involved in, in uh, wrist and, and hand function. So the diagram here shows which muscles, and th those were stimulated by um, in, 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 intramuscular electrode wires, not, not by cuff electrodes. So up in the shoulder and elbow region, you can see the nerves that we implanted. Suprascapular nerve is for shoulder stability. Upper, pe upper pectoralis was for shoulder movement. Thoracal dorsal was for latissimus dorsi. Axillary nerve was for the deltoids. Lung thoracic nerve was for scapular uh, stabilization. Um, the radial nerve for elbow extension and wrist extension and finger extension. Um, these were, I'll talk about the cuffs in a second. And the musculocutaneous was mostly for the biceps for elbow extension. Down in the hand, we, we provided opening and closing uh, functionality and um, pronation and supination. Um, Okay, so the electrodes are shown here on the right at the top. They're, these are the stimulating electrodes. These are, we use the intramuscular electrode that, that's, that I'm pointing to. I hope you can see that. Um, these are recording electrodes, bipolar recording electrodes. We used um, 
the epimesial electrodes in most cases because of the, the muscles that we were are recording from were very thin. The nerve cuff electrodes were new in this project. They had been used in other applications, but not anything like this. Um, these are like basically think of a piece of paper that when you let go rolls up into a, a kind of a scroll configuration. There are four contacts that go around the radius of this uh, circle. And the idea was to size this just right so that you we had 90 degrees separation between the electrodes. Here you can see one of the contacts here. There would be one here, one on the other side, and one underneath. So the, the idea was to be able to stimulate more than one um, nerve fascicle within that peripheral nerve to cause different kinds of activation. Okay, so this is the FES system. Um, we did implant this in three individuals. Um, here's some, some uh, x-rays to prove to you that we actually did this. This was the, the stimulator here in the upper chest. You can see some of the recording electrodes here. You can see them again here. <coughs> Here's a few of the, the nerve cuff electrodes. And this, these are the intramuscular electrodes that, that went down to the hand and arm. And you can see how fine they are. I mean, these little dots here are the electrodes and the, the lead wires are the wispy little uh, lines that you can see there. Okay. So, um, there's a couple of uh, videos here that are playing that show, first of all, me about 15 years ago. If you can see me, you can see that I've aged a little bit, but um, this was in the upper panel here. This is our participant and she's not controlling this. We're driving her, her you know, we've, we've put together a pattern to make her arm move. But this was the first time we did this after her surgery. And we could tell right away that this, the, that at least the FES part of this was going to be successful. The main, the main tasks that we um, had hoped to restore involve reaching out and doing something, picking up something, food, water, what, and different things, and bringing it up to the mouth. That that is a important task in these individuals. Um, so we're very happy with the way that the FES system worked. Um, there's a couple of, of limitations that, that we had to do or that, that I need to bring up. So the movements are slow, especially when she's controlling them. When you look down at the bottom, um, she has to think pretty hard to make these things work. She has to, it's, it's tedious and she, uh, has, uh, quite a bit of, uh, flexor tone in her shoulder and elbow. Um, that really uh, limited what we could do in, in terms of holding her arm up against gravity. Um, so we had to use a, a mobile arm support. You can see you can see it in both of these um, videos. It basically supported her arm against gravity. In fact, in all three of our participants, we were not able to stimulate the deltoid and other um, shoulder um, abduction muscles to to generate uh, anti gravity support. Uh, it's something that, that we're, we're hoping to address in our in our next studies. The EMG user interface was okay. Um, she could use it. Um, in the end, um, the movements or the the recordings were pretty. It's a pretty unnatural way to control your arm, and so we had to develop uh, basically a code. It says okay. Uh, two uh, platysma lefts and a and a auricularis means move my arm out to this position. So it turned into a very contrived uh, interface, which she could use, but it was not, it was definitely not the answer. So I guess in our first few uh, participants here, the outcomes were that we could get good um, activation of the muscles that we needed. We could power the movements. The interface was still lacking, the user interface. So th that's when we moved to the brain computer uh, interface approach. Um, this is our group. Um, we are a consortium of people from Cleveland, from Massachusetts General Hospital and Brown University in, uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, and Stanford University in, in California. Um, the way that this, uh, this group came together was uh, John Donahue, who I'm pointing to here, 
is a pretty famous uh, neuroscientist brain, um, motor control neuroscientist, who called me up and said, hey, Bob, uh, you guys are really good at restoring these movements through electrical stimulation, and we're really good at figuring out uh, signals from the brain. Why don't we work together? So this, this was 15 years ago, and we still are working with these, with these people and, um, and with others as well. So that, that was the nature of this. Um, my two main colleagues here in Cleveland are Baloo at Giboye, who is a, a, a BME faculty member, a biomedical engineering faculty member, and is really has taken charge of the, the brain interfacing part of this project. And Jonathan Miller is a neurosurgeon who has, has been invaluable for his, his understanding of the brain, his practical understanding of uh, the surgical constraints and obviously his surgical skills. Oh, he's from University Hospitals, our neighbor. Okay, so I'm gonna go back. Um, this was our goal, if you remember, which was a fully implanted uh, FES system with state-of-the-art uh, electrodes and a state-of-the-art uh, um, basically recording and stimulation. And this is where we are right now on the right-hand side. and there's a couple of things to notice uh, right away. It's not fully implanted. In fact, it, the, the brain computer interface that we're using is percutaneous, and I'll come back to that, but recording electrodes are implanted into the motor cortex, and the wires are led up to the skull, but there's a there are connectors on the skull. And then when, when, when we are um, using this in, in our experiments, we connect, um, recording electro or recording uh, amplifiers that then go to an external um, system that that interprets those recordings but it's percutaneous so there's wires that go up through the skin and through the skull likewise our our functional electrical stimulation system is also percutaneous so we implant um, intramuscular electrodes through the skin using hi uh, large hypodermic needles and place them in a number of muscles around the shoulder and the arm. And those, those wires also go out through the skin and are connected to an external stimulator. So the overall system is recording brain signals through this percutaneous interface. There's a computer-based system that, rec that takes these recordings, decodes them into intended movements, those intended movements are then sent to our stimulator, which, which um, stimulates the appropriate muscles in the appropriate temporal patterns to allow that movement to happen. Okay, so this is where we are right now, and this is what I'm going to describe um, quickly here for, um, uh, for, for our system. So we have 192 intracortical electrodes. I'll show this in a second. They're small, very small. Um, they're two, nine, these intracortical electrodes are two 96 channel, they're called Black Rocks, the company, they're often known as Utah electrode arrays because they were developed in Utah. There's external signal processing and decoding. That's the brain interface. The FES system has 36 intramuscular um, uh, electrodes that are, have been put in percutaneously in an external stimulation system. And the idea here was to show that this concept could work and in a way that could be easily reversed. These are all percutaneous that could be removed quickly and easily. And it was basically a dress rehearsal for what we hope to do uh, in the future. These are the, the recording electrodes. These are very small. So this, this array here is, is 10 electrodes by 10 electrodes, four millimeters on each edge. Um, the, this, the tips of these spikes are, I mean, the, are about 1.5 millimeters. Excuse me. So you can see how small they are. Um, I don't know if you know how large an American penny is, but it's pretty small. Um, this is the uh, array. Um, this is the connector that's bolted to the skull. And there's an array there. This is a, here is a photograph of two of the arrays implanted in our participants. So this is a surgical diagram. We had used uh, functional MRI to help us place these. We have anatomical um, landmarks as well. 
but you can see the two the two red dots here on the cortex are, are where we implanted these two electrodes and this just shows the the basic uh, electrode interface so there's an electrode here that has the or the array has the 96 electrodes going in 1.5 uh, millimeters and then there's a bun wire bundle that comes up to this connector The FES system is pretty straightforward. There's a, a hypodermic needle with basically a coiled wire that comes to, and, it's, and there's a hook that helps hold it into place. Um, this is bare uh, stainless steel. So this is where the stimulation occurs. And you can see about the size. This is during the implantation procedure. These are uh, a number of the electrodes coming through the skin. These are actually quite, quite, quite uh, fine electrodes. And then this is the final configuration um, after some healing. So the wires come through the skin, they're coiled, it seals them off quite well from the outside world. And they're connected to uh, this, this connector here that when we want to do stimulation, we just connect to this and we can stimulate. Um, I'm showing all the muscles that were um, implanted. It's quite a few, um, pretty extensive. Oh, and like I said, we all we in, this is our our most recent participant, and he also used a, a mobile arm support to help him uh, support his arm against gravity. Okay, I'm going to go quickly because I don't want to run out of time here. This these this is an example of some of the recordings that we take. You can see we can record action potentials from these individual cortical neurons. Um, we we do some calculations. We ended up I won't go into detail here, but we ended up um, doing threshold crossing. So how many times during a, a period of time does the does a action potential happen basically? And we have a what's called a decoder, which uses those signals and relates those signals to the movements that the person is is uh, trying to perform. And we either had them uh, control a virtual arm, which they observed on on a screen in front of them, and then later on, we had them control their own arm through the electrical stimulation. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip through these because uh, I think they're details. Okay. I'm told that if, if uh, the sound's playing, I can't be heard, so I'm, go I'm gonna mute this. Um, this is our participant. You can see the um, amplifiers, they're bolted now to the connectors on his skull. This, this is a training um, uh, experiment early in the time that he had this. So he is watching. You can see he has the, these black glasses on. These are, are 3D um, glasses. And the screen is also displaying a 3D picture. That's why it looks so fuzzy. But the idea is that he is, he's controlling this arm, OK? And that, that's his feedback. But in, in fact, what he's doing is thinking about making these movements. And we are stimulating the muscles in his arm to make these movements. And what is displayed on the screen is the actual movement. We're, we're just reflecting his actual movement on the screen. Um, on the right-hand side are the signals that are, that are relevant here. So on the upper panel there, there's two of them. One of them is for an elbow flexion extension command. And one of them is for hand opening and closing, the aperture of the hand. And these, these are computed from our decoder. So these are based on the brain recordings. And you know they go up and down as he's thinking about making different movements. It generates a velocity command. A lot of these uh, neurons are velocity sensitive. And then we take these signals and we map them so the, the dotted lines that are going back and forth here um, horizontally in the, in the second panel, this is just a reflection of these signals in the upper panel. And so as, as the signal goes back and forth, it recruits muscles to different um, extents. That's what these different colored lines are. So if it's zero command, the following happens. But as, it, as the command goes up in, in amplitude, different muscles are rec recruited. And that's how the movement happens. Um, down at the bottom is just a, a reflection of his performance. When the um, target comes up, it, it's a gray box. It's shown as a gray box here. So these are the, the elbow 
in the in the hand target. This is where we want them to do. We want him to move his elbow to a certain angle and open his hand or close his hand. And then the 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 blue and orange lines are his actual movements. So you can see him moving towards the the targets. And when he gets in them for a sufficient length of time, they turn green. That means it's a, it's a success. Okay. So you can see that he's able to do quite well. This is an early, early uh, experiment, um, but it, it was a good one. Okay, so then we, yeah, this is maybe a detail that I can just say very quickly. Um, the performance in these virtual tasks when he was doing this on a screen were really good. Um, the top left thing says percent success, and you can see that it's, it's way up of almost 100% in most cases, 80% at the worst. Um, and that's for, we say, control your elbow, control your, your shoulder, control your hand. As we start adding control your hand and your elbow, uh, you, that's what's shown here, different combinations of, of, um, of movements of the hand and arm, the performance deteriorates. And it kind of tells us that maybe we need more signals to, to record from in order to do more complicated movements. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is that in the virtual cases, they they, he always started these tasks in the middle and moved out to targets. And for uh, the virtual task, when he was doing this on a computer screen, almost 100% success and straight line movements from the center out. When he was controlling his own arm, Again, the success rate was pretty high, but it was a sort of circuitous uh, pathway in many cases. It took, and it was slower. So the virtual control is actually better than the FES control, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, talk about. So these are, these are uh, for us, the most important um, uh, results. So my engineer, uh, Bill Memberg, is on the right, and he is giving verbal commands to our participant to do things, open his hand, you know, close his hand, extend his elbow. And so these are self, you know, he's getting cued um, visually, but there's no, there's no target. So he, he's kind of generating these spontaneously, and he's quite good at it, actually. Okay, so that's one. Um, and then we moved on to more functional tasks. So this is our participant um, working to um, take a drink from a straw. This was one of his big uh, goals. And you can see that he, he was off. He, he missed the target a little bit, his mouth. And he's sort of struggling with his face, which I would have thought, given that the hand and face are sort of next to each other in the, the representation on the cortex, that it would have, it would have messed him up but he was able to separate his hand and, um, yep, Bill wanted to take it from him. He said, nope, one more. So he's able to take a drink from a straw. He's able to control this all by himself. And th this is him generating signals from his brain that then were stimulating his muscles to make his arm move in that way. And my final uh, uh, video from our participant was we asked him part of our protocol is to provide functions that the person chooses and the function that he chose was to eat mashed potatoes now uh, believe it or not but th this was a good thing so he he is you know he has an adapted adapted uh, fork there but he's holding that by his thumb being stimulated and he's able to move his arm and go down and you know get pick up potatoes you know through his own power again he's going to take some yep you know. so this was a big 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 uh success for him he, he he was really happy with this and um it was kind of the highlight of our study okay in the interest of time i'm going to move on quickly just quickly what's next um it looks, this is, our, this, is, this is what the rehab part in my title is. We've expanded the number of arrays that we're going to use. So we're going to record from motor cortex like we did in the first study, but we're also going to do some recordings from the parietal cortex. We're going to do some recordings from frontal cortex, more of a abstract movement uh, commands. 
and we're going to stimulate in the in sensory areas to provide some feedback about uh, the tactile performance. We're also going to use nerve cuff electrodes much more extensively. Um, our previous nerve cuff electrodes had four channels of stimulation. These have 15. And we're going to put them on all the major uh, peripheral nerves in the arm. And the goal here is to um, activate all the muscles of the arm and to be able to do that to generate more power, to generate more uh, fine control. Um, we're on the ver we were on the verge of recruiting participants when the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic happened. So we're a little bit on hold right now as the rest of the world is as well. Okay, so uh, I thank you for your attention. Um, the the take home messages are that we can use functional electrical stimulation to power arm and hand movements in high tetraplegia. Um, we can use BCI uh, interfaces to command upper extremity motions quite well. And I'll just end by saying this was a feasibility demonstration. You know, this is not a take home system. You saw the things that he had to wear to make that work. But we think we demonstrated that this is possible. And there's, there's a lot of things left to explore and to exploit clinically. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you, sir. It was a very fascinating uh, work which you have shown and uh, insight into the future of brain computer interface where the person has lost his arm or uh, maybe even future for the leg and getting the control uh, of his hand back following stroke or any other injury. So we have uh, quite a few questions and uh, uh, one question is uh, what kind of electrode you use for selective muscle to stimulate? Of course you did show those some of the electrode but if you wanted to clarify more. So in, in, the, in our past studies, we used nerve cuff electrodes for the more proximal musculature because the, the muscles are, are more specific in the shoulder. They, they tend to go to synergistic muscles and, um, and we did get some selectivity. We were, and for the radial nerve, we were able to separately obtain elbow extension, wrist extension, and finger extension using three of the contacts from that four contact cuff. Um, for the distal musculature, the hand and the wrist, we used intramuscular electrodes um, that, that are basically like uh, uh, um, wires that are inserted into each muscle individually. They're pretty selective, um, but there's a limit on how many of those we could put in. The technology has moved along since then. So for our, our upcoming study, we're going to use these 15 contact cuffs, a, a number of them. And those 15 contacts should provide ample um, uh, selectivity among the different fascicles. Some of these, you know, we're gonna be implanting the median nerve, the radial nerve, the ulnar nerve, um, and they have many, many uh, different functions, many different uh, fascicles. And we're hoping we can separately activate them. Uh, thank you, sir. Quite amazing uh, what you, uh, you have achieved. What I wanted to know was uh, normally when we do any we have the sensory feedback. So here you are not having uh, somatosensory feedback. Can they do the action in the bar? So I, I, I had there was some interference there and I couldn't hear the whole question. Sorry, it, it, my... repeat. Can the person do the action when it is dark? Because we don't have somatosensory input. Uh, I still, I'm sorry. I, I think you said, can they do it when it's dark? Is that correct? I'm right, I'm right. Um, yeah, yes. this, is a, this is an interesting question. Um, we don't know that. Their, their motions right now, um, we rely on vision for their for feedback. That's how they direct their movements. They're visually controlled. Um, in the dark, that is a, an excellent question. I mean, you know, in, for people that don't have this, they, they've learned a, a model of their arm. They can do things without vision pretty well to a point. Um, I think that's, that's a good question that's gonna have to be explored. I don't know the answer to that. So yet another question is, what is the possibility of using non-invasive BCIs instead of implanted electrodes? 
Yeah, this is a, a, a very uh, actively debated question. Um, at this point, the, the non-invasive uh, recordings like uh, EO, e e EEG, um, they're much less precise and they're, uh, to control them is, is, is artificial. So for ex we did this uh, a number of years ago and for example, to, to open the hand, the participant had to do things like imagine that he was floating. And, you know, it's, it, it just was, again, it was so artificial and so slow that it wasn't deemed as, as practical. Um, there are uh, other ways to do this that people are exploring. You know, first, you need to understand that these electrodes, they are, I mean, it does involve opening the skull. And so that's, that's the big over, uh, uh, hurdle to overcome. Um, the, the electrodes only go in a millimeter and a half, and they're very small, four by four millimeters. So the sort of the physical damage is extremely minimal. Um, other ways to do this are with ECOG. Um, it's not clear that that's less invasive. It still involves opening up the skull, and, it's, and the, the amount of material that you're putting there is much, 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 much larger than for these little microelectrode arrays. Um, you know, there are, there are benefits to recording field potentials like that you get with the, with ECOG, um, that, you know, we, we can record as well, but, you know, I think that's also a question that's going to have to be answered over time.